So just to start again then with welcome to say thank you so much for joining us um, and welcome to the evening. So we are discussing the criminalization of both migration and the humanitarian action and response to migration on the um, borders of Europe. So we are going to be, this is a, a wider um, a wider discussion than simply the Mediterranean, even though we've had a lot of focus in the news on the Mediterranean over the last while. Um, and I'm really pleased that we've been joined this evening uh, by particularly Dr. Aideen Elliott, from, who is currently from Oxfam. She is, her PhD is on the making of EU migration and asylum policy. And um, she's currently research and policy coordinator for Oxfam. Um, she's speaking to us this evening from Athens, where I think a lot of her research has been based. Um, and as she's done an awful lot of work over the course of um, her career on looking at the, the EU asylum policy and also the human rights implication of that asylum policy as well. Um, and then we're also been joined by our Green Party MEP, Grace O'Sullivan, who I think is joining us from Europe, from Brussels at the moment. So we've got a very international speaker this evening um, who, and she ha has been particularly involved directly in the advocacy around the case of Sean Binder. Many of us will be familiar with the case of Sean Binder, who was um, involved in search and rescue missions in the Mediterranean and has subsequently spent the last several years on trial um, in Greece for human trafficking and espionage, a range of different charges that have been brought about um, and brought against humanitarian search and rescue workers. Um, so those are two speakers. I might just, it, just to if it's, indulge myself just for one minute, just to kind of explain why, why I was keen to bring this topic to the Just Transition Greens and why I think it is a, an important topic for us to discuss. I think particularly in the last two weeks, we have seen the, the drowning of hundreds of people in the Mediterranean, and I think it has helped to focus our minds. But at the same time, we, we remember in 2015, it was the, the, I think it was 2015, it was the drowning of Eileen Kurdi, who, whose body and the images of his body were, were went around the world. And in both these cases, they have meant to have been our moral wake up moment where we realize just the horrors of exactly what is happening as a result of EU border policy. Um, and, we, and yet we've, we've failed time and again to actually have those moments of awakening. So I think we are, we are all hopeful and optimistic that there will be that change of direction happen at some stage and how the EU handles migration, that we will see the, the commencement of search and rescue again. We will see the start of safe and legal routes. And yet what we are seeing is consistently we are moving in the wrong direction with that. Um, and while I hope again that this will be our moral moment of waking up and changing direction, I am not convinced it will be unless we have a really earnest evidence-driven policy discussion on how we need to do the, things differently. Um, and I, I would also, I feel I have sat in multiple rooms, particularly many of us who have an interest in this topic will be very familiar with the journalism of Sally Hayden um, and her, her work on the, on the topic. I've sat in multiple rooms with her talking about her work to um, politicians and often they say, what should we do next? And she says, well, I'm a journalist. I'm, I'm here to write about and tell you what's happening. Your job as politicians is to say what we need to do about it. So I think that that's important that we kind of carry on the conversation. It's not simply about awareness. It's also now about the next steps of what we need to do to actually shift our policy direction. And I'm hoping that that's going to be part of the discussion that we're having this evening. Um, but with that, I will hand over to Aideen, who is going to give us a, her a overview of her work and research. Great. Um, thanks a million, Janet. Um, and thanks so much for inviting me. I'm really glad to be here with the Just Transition Greens. And uh, I'm particularly looking forward to the discussion and um, to hearing from Grace about her experiences both in the European Parliament and having travelled um, to Lesbos with Sean. Um, so to begin, I would like to talk about the fact that there are so few legal and safe ways for a person who's fleeing to enter the EU to exercise their legal right to ask for protection, to seek asylum. Um, that 90% of people who claim asylum in the EU have entered irregularly. Um, that's according to European Parliament research from 2018, when that parliament was trying to pass um, legislation on humanitarian visas for different countries. 
So that means that the vast majority of people who flee to the EU um, have to rely on smugglers in order to, to enter EU territory to look for asylum. And asylum seekers cannot be penalized for this according to the Refugee Convention. Um, but we see that people who come to the EU looking for international protection are increasingly treated like criminals. And this ranges from how the language, how people are spoken about, um, to how they're treated, and then to actually being charged um, and being pursued through the courts. So um, we see this in the camps. Um, so the camps that we're all familiar with the terrible um, situation in Maria camp, for example, and several others um, with really inhumane conditions. And the solution to this was supposed to be a new type of camp that's called a closed controlled access center. So while the tents have been replaced by um, containers, these new types of camps really look like prisons. So I visited um, the first one to open on Samos, and it is the place where somebody who has fled and is looking for protection is staying, but it looks like they're in a prison. It's surrounded by barbed wire fences. Um, there's so much security. You're searched every time you go in and out. Um, people are only allowed in and out at certain times of the day. And this has had a huge toll on the mental and physical health of people there. And not only are they not being accused of any crime or anything, but they're, they're still being treated like criminals by being, being kept in that kind of condition. And then there's also the charging of people who came looking for asylum. Um, I think just want to talk about two cases, again, on the island of the Greek island of Samos. Um, so one con they, they both are concerning men who were on a boat that arrived in Samos in November 2020. Um, the boat was carrying 24 people when it began to sink as it approached Greece. And the Greek Coast Guard were called, but they didn't arrive until the next morning. And tragically, a six-year-old boy drowned. And his father, um, a 26-year-old man from Afghanistan, was then charged with endangering his child's life and he faced 10 years in prison. So it's really mind blowing to think about fleeing Afghanistan, to arrive in the EU to look for protection, losing his child and then being criminalized for that. Um, he, he was not convicted. Um, and then another man on the boat, a 23 year old, um, he steered the boat at a certain point and so he was charged with transporting people and endangering their lives. And um, he also was not convicted, but I'm sure as Grace will talk about, it's not just the conviction, it's that hanging over people and the trauma of that, and that it's being utilized as a deterrent um, for people to come and to exercise their rights under international and European law to ask for protection. Um, so, you know, as Grace will talk about the criminalization of humanitarians, and um, I just, you know, I wanted to mention that sometimes we think of uh, people who've come from other European countries um, to provide humanitarian support, and there's also, just to remember that there's also refugees from Syria, from Afghanistan, from Palestine, who are charged um, with um, because of their, their humane humanitarian actions. So for example, um, on the island of Chios, a 23 year old man was providing um, water and food to 11 people who had just landed. And he was charged with facilitating the illegal residence of third country nationals. He was also acquitted. So um, we have seen in Greece and in uh, Poland, a lot of the cases are actually acquitted. Um, but it still acts as a deterrent to people. Um, so I want to stress also that a lot of the spotlight is on Greece, but these problems are not a Greek problem, they're an EU problem. 
Um, so our partners in Poland experience similar issues on the Poland-Belarusian border, which um, has kind of gone off our radars a bit and not been in the news so much, but people are still trying to cross um, from Belarus um, in really cruel and orchestrated ways. Um, coming with some hope um, of fleeing from Syria, Somalia, Iraq, Afghanistan. Um, and there, people in the in the Polish villages um, who have come out to try and help these people with food and water have been harassed by the police. Um, and some of our partners in this group, a Granisa group, have been charged um, for their work on the Poland-Belarusian border in giving medical supplies, food and water to people. And whenever I've heard them talk, they always emphasize that they're the same people who do that work on the Polish-Ukrainian border for which they're praised and celebrated by the government. And um, so there's also, um, you know, uh, a moment to remember that we need to really emphasize that everybody has the same right to ask for protection, no matter which conflict or which um, persecution they're fleeing. And um, so I just wanted to mention as well, the criminalization of lawyers and of um, the people who do search and rescue, <clears throat> excuse me. So our partners in Greece, the Greek Council for Refugees, um, they operate um, sometimes on the Greek Turkish border, supporting people who have come to look for protection in Europe and find themselves in the midst of a pushback over the Greek border. And they have the number of legal aid NGOs, they contact them, they can send their coordinates, and then GCI, the Greek Council for Refugees, send this information to the border guard asking for these people to be rescued. Um, government officials have begun to make comments uh, in the media, in public fora, in parliament, accusing these uh, legal aid groups of collaborating with Turkey. So we can imagine the geopolitical situation between Greece and Turkey and then the implications of that, of being accused of being kind of a traitor. Um, so the ministry or the minister of migration of Ismarakis, um, he said that they um, uh, collaborate with Turkey and um, the deputy minister said that they were undermining Greek sovereignty and national security. So these are the kind of very heavy charges um, that have caused the UN Special Rapporteur, Mary Lawler, um, to uh, express very serious concern about the situation for human rights defenders in Greece. Um, and the stigmatization that those comments from political leaders cause in the public uh, is also an obstacle to their work. So it's creating a very difficult situation for them to work in. And they really stress that where legal assistance is targeted or criminalized in any way, that can prevent asylum seekers and migrants from accessing courts to claim their rights, or importantly, to seek justice where they have um, experienced violations. And I think really, you know, as well as the human rights implications, the rule of law, the democracy implications for all of us of lawyers being prevented from doing their work uh, is very, very serious. Um, so GCR's report on this is called Between Impunity and Criminalization because they really contrast the impunity that people who conduct illegal pushbacks are operating in with the criminalization of people who try to report on this. Um, so not only can the criminalization of lawyers hamper access to the courts, but these are the same lawyers who are reporting on illegal activity by border guards of EU member states. So unfortunately, at several points around Europe, people who are trying to enter to claim asylum as their right um, are pushed back over the border. And in the case of um, 
that they're always in the case of Greece, we have a lot of testimony of how this happens. And because it is always happening in the same way, same stages, it's very systematic um, and organized, which really adds evidence to the fact that it's not some rogue border guards. It's quite strategic. Um, in each case, people are apprehended. Um, they're taken to um, an informal site of detention. Um, in many cases, they, in most cases, they are then um, strip searched and strip naked. And in many cases, they are beaten and sometimes um, sexually assaulted and robbed. Uh, and in a number of cases, in front of children. Then they are grouped together, put onto an inflatable boat and pushed into the sea. And sometimes this happens, it's not just at the border, it's when the people are on EU territory, they are on, on land. Um, so the border guards are violating national law, European law, international law, and the pushbacks are becoming more violent. They are operating with impunity. So there's a real risk that the longer that this goes on and the more normalized it is, the more violent and the more brutal um, the pushbacks become. So um, the, the criminalization of the people who can witness that and report on that is also a very serious rule of law issue um, for all of us in the EU. Um, I see I've gone a little bit over, so I might just finish up that and uh, possibly we'll get to um, touch on more points in the discussion. I'll look forward to people's comments and, and inquiries. Great. Thanks, Amelia and Aideen. That's I think that's a a really comprehensive overview of just uh it's, I mean certainly paints a very stark picture of what where we are at as a European community. Um I know I have a lot of questions for you, so I'm sure other people will as well. Um but I will Grace is we'll move to Grace next who um is our MEP for Ireland South and who has had a lot of personal experience with working particularly in the case of Sean Binder um and his his trial um uh, uh, for uh, by Greek authorities in relation to his role in search and rescue. Um, so I'm hoping Grace might talk to us a little bit about that particular, her experience in that particular case, but also, I guess, give us that little perspective from European Parliament and European Union at the moment about where we are at with um, the policy direction we are moving in at the moment. Uh, and yeah, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Grace. Thanks, uh, Janet, and um, thanks for uh, tracking me down eventually to, to get in front of the, the, the transition greens. Um, so I know you've been, you've really wanted to, to hold this um, form for quite a while because of the, um, the nature of, uh, of migration. And, um, and uh, it's great to hear Aideen as well with your experience and the fact that you're in Athens now, you know, probably working away good up um, on these issues. Um, so, um, uh, look, I, I, today now it was an interesting day in the European Parliament because we were voting on in the committee, uh, the Environment Committee on the Nature Restoration Law. So I was saying to Janet earlier, you know, I'm just uh, trying to twist my head now um, into it, uh, this very, very important uh, topic. And Janet, if you wouldn't mind, just uh, if you give me a little uh, a hand up or something when I'm reaching my 10 minutes, because um, I have a bunch of notes in front of me because there's so much to speak about really, and um, just to give me some guidance. But I was reading um, today, you know, that the International Organization on Migration in, in 2022, they said that five people per day were drowning every day of 2022 in the Mediterranean Sea. So I think that's um, really stark, you know. Um, and then when uh, we look at uh, the recent uh, shipwreck, the, the desperate situation, I'd speak about it a little bit more. Um, but, you know, all the time we're talking about human lives. And a word that has come across my desk a few times over the last while is the that word human cargo. And it just jars every time I hear it being used, the, the word, the term human cargo. And um, that it just it just doesn't seem right, you know, um, and uh, that in a country like Libya, um, the smuggling 
of very um, desperate people is now considered a big business. So that's really shocking. But uh, in any case, um, like I, I traveled earlier this year to the island of Lesbos um, and uh, I, I wanted to see firsthand um, what was happening on the island of Lesbos um, and to meet um, Sean Binder and uh, to attend uh, the court case there the, whereby Sean Binder, who grew up in Castle Gregory um, in uh, Kerry in Ireland, um, where he was being uh, charged along with other uh, humanitarian workers. Um, and uh, what struck me when I was arriving to the island was how close it was to Turkey. So it's just uh, one of the, the um, like you can see Turkey, just you'd almost think you could swim across the, to Turkey, but it's a, it's a, a vicious uh, piece of water. And, um, and that's why, you know, very often people, um, you know, don't recognize the, ri the risks that they're taking, um, but they're fleeing in many cases. Um, uh, so they're, they're prepared to, to uh, face the, the risks in front of them. So anyway, um, it, the big thing here, you know, uh, is that we're seeing over the last number of years that solidarity with migrants is being criminalized. So those who are going out to support people are being criminalized. And um, many, some of these people I would have known over the years have worked with Greenpeace. Uh, so I was uh, in the Mediterranean Sea for years and years uh, on um, environmental and humanitarian work. But many of my former colleagues from Greenpeace went on to work with Sea Watch and different uh, organizations. Um, who are trying to rescue migrants in the Mediterranean Sea? Um, so, I, like I know, I know the motivation of these kind of people, and having met um, Sean Binder and his family and uh, the other migrant, uh, the other uh, humanitarians, uh, you just, um, you know, you know, these are absolutely not criminals, uh, and they they shouldn't um, be facing uh, the. Uh, horrific charges. So in the case of Sean Binder, now um, he uh, and Sarah Mardini, um, and I'd advise anyone who hasn't seen the Netflix, uh, The Swimmers, based on the story of Sarah Mardini and her sister um, when they fled Syria and um, the, the whole uh, journey to, um, to Germany. Uh, it's well worth uh, watching. So it's called The Swimmers on Netflix. But um, when uh, I was there, um, you know, we, I, I attended the court, uh, the court hearing, uh, which was, uh, it was uh, a challenge to get in uh, to the court in the first instance. So I had to, um, you know, use my MEP card um, and really try to, to uh, push my way uh, in there. Um, and then just to see the chaos in the, the court, because the courts, do you know, that this isn't, it's not um, usual for them historically to be charging uh, people like Sean Binder with, uh, as criminals. So it was um, a, like a, a lot of chaos in the courthouse. But um, and then they dropped so their their own charges of of felonies and um, demeanors. So demeanors are the lesser charges that they're they're facing, and they said they cleared them of the demeanor demeanors on a technical level. But then since then, and this was back a few months ago, they've actually um, they've uh, said that they they that they're. Uh, the outcome of the hearing was incorrect and now they're charging them that once again they're back uh, they're going to be called back on the misdemeanors uh, and then later the felony so just uh, knowing Sean I know Sean quite well now I've been working with him since I was in the in the Shannon in the Irish Senate and um, I was in touch with Sean then and um, trying to get seek justice for him and um, uh, but 
you know, he's in London, but he, he just can't get on with his life. It's, it's just like a, a big heavy weight uh, on his shoulders. And that goes for uh, all of the others who are facing uh, charges. Um, and then the other thing is um, that the, um, like the fact that these charges are, are outstanding is having this chilling effect on other um, uh, people who want to go in to uh, offer assistance. And, uh, and I do, it, it does cross my mind, you know, um, with the recent, the fishing trawler that went down now with 750 people on board um, just recently, that um, I, I do wonder if, the because of that chilling effect, a number of the humanitarian vessels have left the area, or they're they're no longer uh, operating because um, they're concerned with the criminal charges they might face. And I, it just crosses my mind what if um, we hadn't this horrid uh, behavior of uh, of frightening uh, humanitarian workers away. Could there have been a chance that one of the NGOs, the non-governmental organizations, they could, you know, easily have been in a, a, a closer maybe to that vessel? I'm only saying it, it may have if they if they hadn't been literally hunted out of the Mediterranean Sea. So, um, you know, uh, so this the shipwreck is like the recent tragedy of uh, Pylos is just uh, it's extraordinary um, looking at the footage. And I, I just, you know, I was at sea myself for 10 years all over the world, and I cannot understand how the Coast Guard or Frontex or any of the, the, the um, merchant vessels that saw that vessel, there were people on board. Firstly, it was completely overcrowded. There were no one was wearing life jackets. I I, the people on those vessels in the vicinity are all seafarers. They did. They shouldn't. They, they should have known to assist. You know, they should have. Uh, they should have uh, recognized that that vessel was um, unstable. That it. Um, you know that uh, th there was going to be a tragedy unfolding. And I, I can't understand uh, why they didn't get involved and take action. And the other thing is, I mean, we have such, you know, um, with such security in the skies now, you know, with satellites and that. Um, again, I, I don't understand. It should be very clear uh, what the, the last hours of that vessel, what happened. Um, so there needs to be an international investigation into into the situation there um so let me just uh, i think I, i'll just go on a little bit about um the situation here in the european parliament and and in the eu and what's happening so uh, at the moment so in 2020 the european commission came forward with the asylum pact and this was um where they were um uh, essentially bundling together a, a bunch of different uh, policy areas um, and they were um, in order to have a comprehensive what they called a comprehensive policy and um, to deal with um, the growing situation of migrants uh, uh, irregular and also um, refugees uh, seeking and uh, moving uh, across uh, borders into into Europe. Um, so uh, in any case, the uh, European Commission uh, presented a new pact on, on um, migration and asylum. Um, yeah, and they were bringing together the policies of migration, uh, integration and uh, border management uh, and bringing them together in a comprehensive way. Um, that was 2020. Um, since then, um, there have been um, negotiations going on. And this is normal in the, the European Union. Um, like the legislation, it takes, it takes years of negotiation 
uh, in order to get what you would expect would be a really comprehensive, a decent piece of legislation. Um, and, you know, obviously um, we would hope one that respects fundamental human rights and, um, you know, supports those seeking protection, um, regardless of how they arrive in the EU. But um, uh, in any case, the negotiations are going on um, what they call the trilogues between the European Commission, the European Parliament and the European Council. And so far, um, they, have, um, they have agreed um, language, so uh, legislation on reception conditions directive. They've uh, also they have, um, uh, they've com uh, completed qualifications regulation. So someone coming into the EU and um, just um, in terms of seeking employment, you know, the, the, uh, their qualifications, resettlement legislation. But what's ongoing still is um, screening regulation, asylum procedure regulation, asylum and migration management regulation, crisis regulation. So there's still, there's still a lot of talks going on uh, around the different policy areas. Um, and uh, my um, concern is that um, if, we, if they don't get on with it, this, this mandate finishes in June, 2024. This is when the, the um, so if they don't, if we don't get um, a, an agreement on the legislation, then it gets kicked out further, which isn't helpful. And um, just to go back as well, uh, Aideen, you were talking about, you know, the, the fact that like it, it, um, how things are changing. It isn't a welcoming environment, you know, on the EU external borders. So, uh, you know, my own approach would always be like, we need to look at things from a, a humanitarian perspective. And, uh, but um, I, that's not happening. That's not what we're seeing. What we're seeing is, as you said, the pushbacks. We're seeing um, Frontex, who is the European border agency. In, in, we know um, they have been uh, collaborating with the Libyan authorities. And the Libyans, as I said at the outset, are making a business out of the whole um, smuggling and human cargo trafficking and that. So, um, so it's, it's just uh, shocking that we lack that humanitarian approach. We lack the ability to show um, uh, solidarity. Um, and uh, all you know, I can say to you tonight really is, um, you know, that like, we all have a role to play. And, um, you know, by just engaging in the whole uh, issue of migration and asylum and becoming more familiar through the work, you know, of Aideen and, and um, many others, you know, uh, and, and see maybe, you know, uh, you can um, uh, draw up letters or these are all work, you know, they're kind of um, pressure mechanisms to uh, put pressure on your MEPs, on your, your TDs and that. Now, Ireland, in a way, you know, um, we're not doing Grace, that. Grace, I might just ask yeah. you to wind if that's okay. Yeah. So Ireland is seen internationally. We're, we're not, uh, we're seeing as um, having a relatively decent approach uh, when it comes to uh, asylum and migration. So look, I'll, I'll finish at that and we can have the discussion. I'd like to hear uh, your own comments because that would be helpful for us in our work as well. Thanks. Great, thanks, Emily and Grace. I really appreciate that. And sorry for having to cut you off there. I think I'd love to let you keep going, but I also am just mindful of your time as much as everyone else's as well. So, um, and then there's just so I, I there's just one other person I was hoping to bring in, who is um, Abdul Barry, who's here as well. And I was just hoping he might just come in as well because um, Abdul, somebody who I've got to know through as a local. Um, at a local level here who is involved, who's an asylum seeker or he has been an asylum seeker in Dublin. He has his refugee status now, but I, th I think it's just important in these contexts to uh, remind ourselves, I guess th some of these uh, conversations are, can be quite theoretical when, when we are um, ha citizens of European countries who, who have the luxury of having passports, which take us across the world where borders are a matter of queuing for a little while to get your visa stamped on your way through to developing countries, but not um, uh, institutions of violence against you and your communities. And I think it's it's sort of 
maybe I, I just wanted to, I was hoping that I would bring Abdul in for a, a minute now to talk about, um, or maybe just offer a little bit of contribution from the perspective of Afghan communities who, who've both ended up in Ireland and who are who are kind of in the process of trying to find those, those non-existent safe legal routes out of Afghanistan at the moment as well. So Abdul, if you were willing to, I would invite you to come in now. Thank you. Uh, good evening to everyone. Thank you, Janet, for having me. And so you told me just one minute. Uh, I never take one minute. I always take more than one minute. But anyway, I will try to. So uh, the first thing, like when uh, a person is starting to, uh, you know, to leave Afghanistan, there is no uh, availability of no routes or no, uh, you know, routes to go. But we are just thinking of like which countries are we are crossing, not the routes or not the. Uh, other opportunities, but we are just counting the countries, which countries we are crossing and what are the issues in those countries. And uh, especially uh, the uh, the worst thing about the, those ways that I have uh, been hearing from refugees as well, because I have been in contact with them uh, throughout the entire process in the Ireland from city west to the uh, to the other camps. So I, ha I have been hearing a lot of stories, uh, a lot of horrible stories, that's why it made me to be uh, everywhere that there is refugee discussion. I have to be there and raise uh, these concerns because those are like the real stories and the real experiences that people have been going through. Uh, one of the, the worst routes that they're coming is just, I will start from Iran. That is like the worst place that a person can, can cross because they directly shoot people. They can my took the MBA classmates uh, in the, back in Afghanistan when they were crossing to Iran. And then the worst, uh, the, the other countries that uh, uh, is Tur Turkey. So it also depends on how much money you pay to the agents, right? So they can give you uh, the better routes and best routes and the worst routes as well. And uh, coming because uh, Aiden also talked about Greece. So let me have a comment on Greece and Italy as well. Uh, sorry, Greece and Bulgaria, that those detention center that I have heard from uh, my friends from Afghanistan that uh, when they uh, when they uh, catch these people, they take all uh, of their belongings, their clothes, and send them naked back to Turkey. So, when, uh, so uh, in front of families, they, when they send naked uh, families, children, women back to Turkey naked, and when you take that human dignity from people, then automatically you are uh, paving the way for the criminal criminalization of those people they themselves become criminals because you took the dignity of uh, themselves, the dignity of human, the basic rights from them. So that's like the very easy way to, uh, you know, to divert people to do criminal activities. And they themselves become, because I have heard the stories that some of the people that are going through this process, they become part of those community, part of those detention center, and then they become agents by themselves. They become facilitators and then becoming part of human trafficking in those ways because they have gone through the, the, those worst experiences. And um, the other thing that I have heard uh, was the worst thing that in the, the detention center, the words and the language that they use, uh, you know, that is very infuriating. Like for example, it makes you very angry, it makes you like lose your passions and yell at them or have an argument with them. Be, uh, that, that's, that's some of the uh, refugee that told me their experiences. Uh, because you know, for example, some Muslims, they have like some sensitive issues with, um, with the kind of things that is going on and they treat them and using those languages uh, with them to, you know, just, just like to avoid them. Like for example, Aiden might have uh, better information that zero Afghans get asylum seeker in Greece. Like none get asylum seeker or protections in, in the Greece. If you go to the statistic as well, they don't give any uh, asylum seeker or protection to the Afghans, like never. So that's why like, even if you, uh, even they take you to the interview, this is how you treat, uh, this is how they treat you, making uh, like the worst language that you can hear, you can hear from a person. And, um, Anyway, those are the, uh, the issues that have been going on. When we are reaching to Ireland or other parts of the country, then this becomes like a kind of like the best places, the best people, you are being welcomed, you have been in a different world. But those borders are uh, completely different. And uh, as uh, Grace uh, also pointed out, one thing that I am also concerned, and I always thought about this, that the border control policy or law 
in the immigration law. This doesn't go together. If I am controlling my border, then I can, you know, how can this bordering, uh, you know, controlling a border and then immigration law or the law of migration can go together? Uh, you know, uh, this has to be, uh, you know, reviewed that how a, a border police, because the law is being implemented by a police in the border, right? So how he can control the border and how then immigration law allows him to treat people differently because he is refugee, he is not criminal. If I am crossing the border to your country, will you implement me like under the criminal law or under the immigration law? So these are also like, I think the kind of policy issues that needs to be uh, reviewed. And uh, I hope things get better at the end of the day. Maybe as you said, we will keep our voice up and we will engage in this conversation and let's see. Uh, what happens even if we help some people or few people then we might have done something thank you janet thanks a million um okay i want to open it up now to some questions if that's okay and um, we have one or two that have come in just in the chat so i might we might start with them but if anybody else would like to ask a question then please do raise your hand at this point and um, otherwise i'll just work through my long list of questions which i'm sure you might want some change of scene for me. Um, so uh, the ones that have come through in the chat, there is one which is um, a factual one, which is the from Miriam, who says, is Ireland supportive of Frontex or do we intend to join it and fund it? So um, Aideen, or Ellie, Ellie, Aideen, Aideen or Grace, um, you might like to just speak to Ireland's relationship with Frontex. And I think from my understanding, that quite ambiguous relationship as to where the funding and support actually is coming from. Um, but that, I think that would be a, a useful to get more your perspectives on and a bit of clarity. And then the other question, which I think if I'm correct is, here is saying, the, are the economics of debt, continued European resource extraction, interstate corporate corruption among some of the stories yet to be told more fully regarding what is sustaining and worsening all of the suffering. So I think if I'm correct in understanding that there's an, there's a the question there is around to the, the extent to which we can address the root causes that are promoting um, migration. And certainly I think, you know, touching on, I guess, what I feel is, in my opinion, maybe quite misguided European policies, which is thought to um, a securitization approach to the prevention of migration instead of a in addressing the the root causes in a meaningful way that is prompting people to have to leave um, and to, to feel sort of pushed towards leaving. So um, I might start with the two of them if, if either of you would like to come in on them or if you have any other thoughts you'd like to respond to at this point. If I, I come in on Frontex. So I mean, um, uh, so for, my understanding is, is um, like Frontex is, is made up of the Schengen countries, you know, um, and uh, Ireland's not a member of Frontex, but we do partake in different activities. And what I can say is that Frontex in the in uh, the European Parliament is considered very poorly because of its relationships with different like the Libyan government. Um, with their behavior in relation to migration. And that last year, um, when it came to vote for funding for Frontex, the, uh, we, we voted against uh, funding them because, uh, because of uh, the fact that it is exactly um, what we've kind of talked about, um, the fact that, that uh, there is, you know, they're aware of pushbacks. They um, almost uh, preside over the culture of, of uh, criminalization of, of these behavior um, that uh, Abdul Bari was talking about, uh, the, um, like this horrific behavior that's happening in countries like, like Turkey. Um, and that they, I mean, they're meant to be a border control they're not they shouldn't be um they shouldn't be like a law enforcement to themselves so i think there's huge question i know there's huge questions here in the european parliament 
with regard to Frontex and their operations and how they carry out their operations. Uh, and it has to it has to change because and that just leads into the next question about the overall um, uh, issue of migration. Um, and, you know, um, like we have we've known and we see for years that uh, the numbers of migrants uh, on the move is growing. And we know, particularly uh, from my own uh, uh, perspective, going back to the 1980s, when we talked about climate change and the impacts of climate change on, on um, populations in you know, different African countries, in many countries, because of drought and uh, you know, because of war, that there would be much more uh, migration to to the north uh, and to the south because the the belt so the equator those areas would become uh, almost impossible to uh, live in you know so like we've known this for years so it shouldn't be a big any big surprise that we're having uh, we're seeing people on the move and then in Europe itself uh, I mean certainly um, you know we talk about the opportunities that we uh, in Europe can uh, offer uh, and we can avail of uh, from uh, migrants coming to Europe, seeking uh, a, a particular uh, lifestyle and jobs and opportunities. So I don't know why, how it's got, it's got out of hand so badly. And I think once again, just to refer back to the, the vessel that went down off uh, Pylos, I mean, that's just, the, the numbers are extraordinary and um, you know the loss of life is is horrific you know and um, so like you said Janet at the outset we saw um, the the young child um, who washed in on the beach many years ago and we thought that would be the the shock factor that would all get us to um, search our humanitarianism really and our approach uh, but it hasn't happened and it's not it's becoming more um, more difficult and then as we move towards you know center and far right and and this pushback uh, even in terms of the culture of acceptance of migrants in the various uh, member states and then when you see that member states who don't want to to um, uh, work on burden sharing or support mechanisms or whatever, uh, that they now have a, a get out of, uh, a, 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 they can pay. So instead of taking, that, that's when the mechanisms that's been put into the, um, the asylum pact that uh, countries could pay uh, if they didn't have the, the facilities, which that isn't, uh, that's not a, a proper approach either to my mind. So I'll hand over to AD. Thanks, Grace. Um, yeah, I, I would definitely agree. So um, Grace, uh, we're talking about the new pact on migration and asylum. And um, just because I suppose we said we'd talk a bit about policy uh, solutions and what can be done. So I just wanted to bring up two, two points on that. And one is um, that uh, the pact is under negotiation. Um, as you probably know, it didn't in the last mandate of the parliament before the elections in 2019, that whole um, four years that was spent on it um, didn't reach agreement. So there is kind of, uh, you know, under, under time pressure. But um, the meaningful changes that needed to happen haven't happened so far. So as people probably know, um, the reason there are, are so many more people in Greece and Italy and countries with an external border is because of the Dublin system that in the majority of cases, when you arrive to the EU to look for protection, you have to do so in the first country that you arrive in. Um, and there's been no real reform of that, which means the majority of responsibility for processing asylum applications and then for hosting people is on those countries with an external border. And that creates a kind of perverse incentive then to keep people out for those countries, especially if they're not getting solidarity from the other EU member states. So by not reforming Dublin, they're creating this perverse incentive to not do search and rescue and instead to push people back. And then as Grace said, um, we, we need a, a proper solidarity principle 
where when a country with an external border reaches a certain number of people, then they are relocated to other EU member states. So in 2015, Ireland opted in to relocate people. Um, we did relocate asylum seekers from Greece. But now um, a member state um, under what was agreed in Luxembourg um, on the 8th of June this year can pay 20,000 euro um, to opt out. And so the Irish government has said that um, they fully support these negotiations and these outcomes, but um, they don't apply to us because, as Grace said, we're not in the Schengen area, but the Irish government might decide to apply them later on. So we're asking um, that the Minister for Justice representing us at the Council of Ministers and the Taoiseach representing us at the European Council does not support these and instead supports a more solidarity, human rights, rule of law approach. And um, just to give a plug, as Grace said, for um, writing to people, I'm putting in the chat now our petition um, that we're sending to the Taoiseach and the Minister for Justice. And we're going to submit it in the autumn um, ahead of a council meeting. And we're encouraged that today um, Grace and every Irish member of the European Parliament signed a joint letter to the European Commission asking for urgent action on pushbacks. And this evening, the civil engagement group in the Shannon, where Janet is joining us from, also have a motion for search and rescue and pushbacks. So we have two out of the three houses that we have Irish politicians in, um, you know, advocating for this. And I think that does represent kind of that Irish people don't want to see this. People in Ireland don't want to see um, pushbacks in our name or, or drownings um, and no search and rescue, absolutely. Like people were so proud of um, our naval services participation in 2015 in search and rescue. So, um, you know, uh, that, that, that's what, that's I think what people want and that's what should be prioritized in the pact. Um, and just to pick up on something that Abdul Barry, you were saying about the behavior of border guards and how can this be pleased? And um, one proposal in the pact um, from the commission is for um, a proper way to monitor the borders, like a watchdog. So an independent border monitoring mechanism that would be there and observing and make sure that, that things are being done correctly. So um, we're asking that our representatives push for that to be real and not a box ticking exercise, but really robust um, and be able to do what it needs to do. Um, and then just on the question of Frontex, yes, so we're not in Frontex in any kind of normal way, but we join on, for example, um, joint returns um, and things like that. And um, as Caroline pointed out, Frontex's budget has, so has it grown by four or five times in the past few years. And I think this really shows that an illustration of where the emphasis is on, like people just want to come and work and learn and live next door to us. And we're sending what would be sent for an armed threat. Um, so, you know, the, the securitization um, and criminalization of increasing Frontex's budget. So Ireland has also increased our um, contributions to Frontex over the last two years. Um, so um, another question was about the money given to Tunisia. And I think the person framed it as a kind of bribing. Um, so um, we're releasing a report in September about the use of what's called overseas development assistance, but is actually being used for security, securing borders to stop people from moving. Um, so we hope that the pact negotiations at least it's open, is some opportunity to shift um, away a bit from such a criminalized approach and um, to a more humane one. So Thank you very much. Yeah. Can I just add, uh, just the new pact that is under negotiation at the moment, it is the language in there around the criminalization of search and rescue workers is, um, is better uh, it's not strong enough for the Green Group, but at the same time, it is um, recognising the role that the NGOs can play. And I, I think um, any way we can um, diminish that chilling effect 
um, and to have like the when you spoke about Alan Curdy, the little boy uh, who died drowned in washed in on the beach. After that, there was massive um, uh, support uh, ships arriving to the Mediterranean from uh, NGOs and that. And I uh, personally, I'd like to see that again because I know that um, that that is also creates a watchdog effect on the other uh, on the countries. Uh, along the external borders, you know, um, so I think that that would be good. But uh, and then just that, as you were saying, this the other routes, um, not only the sea routes, but also the land routes, and there needs to be some kind of uh, a, a monitoring of what's going on on those routes because, uh, you know, as Abdul was saying, this horrific stuff happening, and it breaches all human rights conventions. Great. Um, look, and I'm, I'm conscious of, I guess, a couple of things here. Um, one is that it is, um, it's almost eight o'clock now. We do try to keep these things to well, an hour. Nine, nine o'clock for Aideen and myself. Sorry, nine o'clock for you guys. We're an um, um, international group tonight. Um, but then the other thing is that I was keen at the start of this that we would um, try to, I guess, move that into the policy the identification of like policy steps, what we need to be looking for. Um, I'm I'm sitting in Leinster House this evening because I've been sitting in on the, the discussion in the Shannad this evening um, about a motion on the uh, criminalization of migration, of the particularly focused, I think, on the Mediterranean in this case. Um, but the I, I was kind of struck by a couple of things tonight. Um, and one of them was the mention of um, the need when when the the so the government put forward a counter motion and the counter motion has um, talked about the um, kind of watered down a lot of the commitments and the desire to um, address the issues um, the the human rights implications of all this. So um, I, um, um, I I was I was just struck by one thing that was said by the, the government of putting forward that motion and that was that we can't um Ireland can't act alone and we need to be looking for cross European solutions so I was just I guess I'd ask you both to comment on that or if you think that there's a, a, a role for Ireland to um act alone in any of this or what what Ireland acting alone might look like to try and improve the situation here or what we need to do at a cross European level Aideen, I'll, I'll let you go first. I, yeah. I'm awfully sorry I was distracted there, so I, I didn't pick up on all of your the question, Jan. Yeah, um, well, just that, um, you know, there's room for Ireland to, like, if our Minister for Justice is uh, sitting four times a year at a table with the other Ministers for Justice, this is an opportunity to discuss these things. Um, so I think there's there's room there, um, and then also to you know, like Ireland has supported um, solidarity mechanism where people would be relocated and other EU member states. So to continue to support that, um, and then to be very strong in calling for um, investigations of allegations of pushbacks, um, as Grace said. Um, an investigation into um, the tragedy in of the, the town of Pilos of Greece um, a few weeks ago, so that we don't have this continuing impunity. So, like, you know, the the closed controlled access centres I mentioned, the fact that they're 100% EU funded, that's Irish money as well. So we have a responsibility and we have a, a position. We're, we're not outside, we're at the negotiating table. Um, so absolutely, we can join with um, other like-minded member states and be a, a progressive force within the EU um, and not kind of just um, support the normalization of the deterioration in standards, as we've said, because I think deterioration in standards is actually so weak when we're talking about the loss of the absolute basics um, of rescuing somebody if they're dying. Um, so there's certainly room in the in the negotiations of the pact for Ireland to play a role there. So um, please see our petition for more details. 
Yeah, I, I would agree with all what you're saying there, Aideen. I mean, I, I think Ireland, you know, we do um, uh, hold, um, uh, you know, a very positive uh, position as uh, one of the 27 member states. And we can have like, um, you know, strong position in support of solidarity, uh, in support of um, uh, the, um, of, of uh, um, you know, yeah, the pushbacks and, and all, like just that, as you were saying, Nadine, just progressive humanitarian uh, rule of law uh, support for um, those seeking, um, be it, you know, uh, seeking the opportunity to look in, uh, to work in our country or to seeking protection in our country. Um, and I think, like I said, you know, it, it's not perfect, but um, certainly uh, I would um, engage with other MPs and, um, you know, when we look at the um, Ireland and how uh, we are dealing with uh, migrants, it's, it's not perfect by any account, but it is uh, better than many other countries in the EU. Um, and so uh, it really, the minister, our minister has great opportunity and um, they're at, at those regular meetings um, to really uh, um, put forward strong uh, uh, policies and that just that that strong uh, support for solidarity and against pushbacks and that and I think that will go a long way um, in also forming the position of the European Council and then here in the the Parliament the Green Group would be seen as very progressive we have a brilliant MEP, her name is Tinika Strike from the Netherlands. She's a professor and her background is in, in human rights and uh, migration and law. And she's just really great leader for us uh, in the Green Group. So um, in that regard, uh, that's the, the council, uh, the minister, the MEPs. And then of course, don't forget, um, you know, we do have representation in the European Commission with uh, Moraid McGuinness, who has been around a long time now, you know, and again, um, you know, uh, even if her uh, portfolio is finance, financial services, she still has a voice at the table of the European Commission. So, um, you know, do uh, leverage that as well. Um, so that's all from my side. Great. Thank you both very much. So I guess if I'm right, then in sort of looking at this, we've got... Aideen, you sort of mentioned the independent border oversight mechanism there. We've talked about the role for the Minister for Justice, particularly in this. And Grace, think earlier you were talking about MEPs and just that the role for the European Parliament, particularly in, in raising that, um, uh, consistently pushing for stronger protections around it. So there's sort of multiple points of, of work in there. And obviously then we have our own work that needs to be done domestically in supporting and in, um, recognizing the rights of people who have made it this far and who are seeking asylum in our country as well. So I guess there's sort of multiple points of engagement there. It is just frustrating, I guess, that despite like these these, these realities have been the same for, for five, 10 years now, and yet we are continuing to move in the wrong direction in this sort of this stuff. And so the, the death toll is increasing, the um, abuses are getting worse, and it does feel a little bit, um, yeah, there's a frustration there, certainly. But um, I guess in, in wrapping up, I will also say I've spent the last two days at this um, international the or the forum on international security and uh, security policy, as, as it was called for um, in Dublin Castle and in a room that is about 85 percent male that was consistently looking for security, securitization solutions to the challenges of Europe at the moment. And um, I will say that it is refreshing to sit in a panel of women for the evening and with the con excellent contribution from Abdul Barry as well, looking at more humanitarian solutions from our um, for the challenges that we face. Um, and how we can respond to them and what the role of Europe and Ireland is within it. And um, so I like firstly, thank you to Aideen and thank you to Grace. Thank you to Adol Barry for your contributions this evening. And I think it has been a really, really useful and um, useful discussion. And I hope there are some action points that we're going to take out of it and that we can move forward with. I know Aideen is hosting or is 
working on another discussion through Kolov, I think, in the next couple of weeks that is further looking at these subjects. So, Aideen, you might we might circulate that link around to the various mailing lists, or you put it in the chat there, I think, um, so that people will have a chance if they want to go a little bit deeper in this discussion as well in the next few weeks. Um, but I will leave a last word maybe to both of you if you want to, if there's any kind of summing up thoughts that you have from the discussion this evening. Um, yeah, I would just say that uh, when I've met some Irish politicians, they've said, you know, this is not a doorstep issue. So I'd say it's up to us, us to make it a doorstep issue. Um, so as Grace said, letters do help. I remember back in 2015 from my research, I was um, reading the Dáil records and several TDs said that they were inundated with letters and phone calls. And I think this is a moment for that again, because as you say, like, we are all shocked at what happened. And I think that that makes a difference. So I would encourage people obviously to join our campaign and then to do um, your own and talk to your friends and family about it. Because um, I think that they underestimate um, how much solidarity there is. So we need to be vocal in, in our own solidarity. And if, I, uh, um, thanks Dean. And if I can just say for me, um, listening to Abdul Barry's story like the, these are you know the stories of people like yourself uh, Abdul Barry who have made the journey like that like it's demystifying the the myths that are out there and humanizing and that that to me is the most powerful and when I went down to Lesbos and I went into the UN um, HCR, the human rights, the tents, uh, and sat with families to eat and to hear their stories. And that helped me in explaining then why, you know, we were pushing for um, support, support mechanisms and that. And um, so, you know, I really thank you so much, uh, uh, Abdul Barry, for being here tonight as well. And, um, you know, and if I could just say to Janet and to the Transition Greens, that. Do you know, like this is the best way for you to learn what's going on on the ground is to, to listen to the stories of people and using all of your platforms then to um, highlight um, the fact that we are all one humanity and we, if we, you know, um, are going to uh, strive to do the best for, for the planet and humanity, then we need to reach out and touch each other and, and recognize that it's the solidarity that will make us stronger and not uh, by division. Great. Thank you so much, everybody, for your participation tonight. Um, and I hope that we will keep this conversation going within Just Transition Greens and with the wider, the wider political system as well, and just keep pushing for, keep raising it, making it as, as vocal and as powerful and as an issue as we can within our, as politicians and within our systems. Um, and hopefully this is something that we will, um, yeah, we, we will be able to turn the tide on or turn the boat on or whatever the phrase is um, in, the next, in the next while, because certainly we have been on a very bad direction with this stuff over the last number of years. So um, yeah, thank you very much, everybody. And- Thank you very thanks. much. Thank you. thank you very much. Keep thanks, safe. Thanks, Janet. Thanks, Grace. Thanks, Dr. Barry. Au revoir. Bye. Thanks so much. Thanks for coming.